Because for some people, this will be the first time they're being asked to put information on a poster. And you'll have all these background thoughts about what size is the poster, how they get the information. And we mentioned earlier, um, one of the participants was saying about the use of visual images. Now, posters, things like um, pie charts, graphs, showing improvement or change, that's probably a good way of getting information on rather than having paragraph after paragraph. So again, it's, it's probably normal if you've never been involved in developing a poster before to be a wee bit apprehensive about it. I think the other thing with this as well is for me when you're presenting posters, it's about run it by your colleagues. If you've been pre if if you've got access to maybe some of the previous participants that were on other programs, because I know when we did this session face to face, Shona, when we were delivering this wee bit, this is where we had a selection of posters for people to look at, and then they could. We would ask them, pick out the one that you think is the best. You could never pick the best one because some people like images, some people like text, some people like photographs, that kind of thing. And, and what the message we were saying there was there isn't such a thing as the best poster. It's about a poster that gives you accurate information about your project that you've been working on. And that some people will find it interesting the way you presented it, some people not. But it's about getting the key information on it. Okay, dokie. Shall we move on now? Can you see? Can you see my slides? Okay, Liz. Yeah. Or your slides. Yep. Yeah. But it's not moving on. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just wasn't clicking my my button. Sorry, it's a mouse. It's a question question from Nikki, Liz. Okay. Sorry to interrupt, Liz, but I'm going to do a shameless plug for the new EHPQI resource page and just say there's a section on there. Um, we have a little tile for Spread the Word, which we're going to add some of the resources from today, but I've already uploaded a selection of old QIP posters and skill posters and script posters. So um, if you want to go in and look at, I'm not going to say the good, the bad and the ugly, they're all fantastic posters on there that will show you a range of different styles and you can go in and just see some examples of previous QI projects. If Once you've seen how you're supposed to do it well, you can go in and have a look at those. Thanks, Nikki. Okie dokie, do you want me just to carry on? Yes, please. Yep. Okay. So this wee section is half an hour or so on poster presentations. Um, and I think to get the, the ball rolling on poster presentations, what we need to have a wee consideration of is what's the purpose of your poster? So again, it's a visual representation of your project, what you've got written in detail there. The first thing you need to do is attract people's attention. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but the first slide I had there was turnips, tea cakes, wagon wheels and curly whirlies. I'm assuming that some people will be saying, what's he got pictures of these chocolate biscuit things on the screen for? And again, for me, your poster, if it does that at the beginning, whether it's in relation to the title, or whether it's in relation to an image or something, something that just makes people stop for a wee second and think, mm, this looks interesting. I'll go and say, even if it's not a topic that they're particularly interested in, if you can get their attention up front, they may well become more interested in what your project was all about. And once, they, once you've caught their attention, you need to then think about how do I keep that attention by getting the information that I, th that, that I think they will find of value, how do I get that information across quickly? So planning the content of your poster, and again, I've highlighted in green here my must, shoulds and could, because this is not just about trying to write the whole of your project and stick it in a poster. So what are the key things that people must know about what you've done? What are the things that you should and could? So when you get your first draft of your poster done, and if you're doing it through medical illustration, they will send you a copy of your poster. That will then give you the time to look and say, well, that section's too big, and maybe need to move that image. There's some information in here that I think on hindsight is maybe not as relevant as it, as it should have been. So again, coming back to the principle of must, should and could, it's about how do I maybe pick four or five aspects of my project that I think are really important that I must include in that poster. And again, if you go in with the mindset of I've got to get everything in that I've done in the project, you're not going to be able to do it. You're going to have far too much information 
And if people are interested in your poster and want to find out more, then you can think about giving them the paperwork on your project and going into more detail. Your title and this, the title is the thing that will grab people's attention and also including the names of people involved. When, when we did this in the past, I'm going to smile here, but some of the posters when people sent them, because I, I always offered this wee kind of extra service. So send me your poster as a draft and I'll have a look at it because I probably know nothing about your project, but I should be able to tell. Now, the number of people that had titles of projects that were like three lines long, and by the time you got halfway through the second line, you were thinking, oh, geez, this is boring. I can't be bothered reading all this. So one of the things that used to help people with was, how do we shorten the title of your poster? How do we make it a wee bit more snappy and a wee bit more eye-catching? And if you want to tell people this is a national project and it's in relation to and it's about, then they put that in your title. Put something like how to make your life easier or how to get the most out of your working day or how to make your patients happy, how to save money, and then draw them into what it is you're doing. So again, it's also important up front to say who's involved in this piece of work because you're probably not just doing this yourself. You've got colleagues and, and people that have been helping you with that they need a wee bit of recognition as well. When it comes to the content, again, it's a bit like when you're delivering a presentation. you got to tell people up front, why did I do this piece of work? What was it around? Was it about improving a clinical aspect of care or was it about improving patient care or, or what it was? And you need to, in your content, give obviously a wee brief overview. What was it that the issue was? What did we want to do about it? Here's how we did it and the main results were. Now, I'm going to go back to the presentation. Tell people what you're going to tell them about, tell them about it, and then tell them what you've told them. The tell them what you've told them is either your pie charts, your graphs, or your photographs, or your images, or some samples of maybe patient feedback or colleague feedback, something that just reinforces what you've covered. I'm getting into gesticulating now to try and engage with the audience here. Okay, so if that's okay, your methods, most people start off with a snappy title, then they'll have a wee paragraph around the project and what was involved. And then the next part, which is probably the most important part of your poster, is giving a wee bit more detailed account of what you did, because that's what people are going to be interested. They'll be interested in your outcomes, but they're probably more or equally interested in, so what method did you use? Was it patient questionnaires? Was it peer group appraisals or, or whatever? So again, the method of how you do something, I think a lot of people are more interested in how you do it practically than some of like the models and the theories and things around pieces of work. So again, this is your wee chance, but again, think back to must, should and could. What are the four or five key points that I want to get in to tell people how I did this and, and give them that wee extra bit of detail? Your outcomes and results, they should show, and I've put illustrative examples of the work, and this might be the point where you then introduce some visual imagery. You may well show um, staff working with patients, or you may have, again, we quotes and bubbles and bullet points about what the feedback you got was. So does that kind of make sense? It's about maybe not having everything written in text and paragraphs, but have some wee things that attract their attention. And that obviously has to show your outcomes and results. In your conclusion, I feel like this is really obvious. You've got to say, what are the main results of my findings? Now, if I was doing a poster now, I would try and make sure that that last part was in big font, was very bold, was like made to stand out. Because again, a lot of people, although they want to know what it is you've done and how you've done it, the key thing is, has this made a difference? What's the benefit? If I was to then think about doing this, what would I achieve and get out of it? So again, for me, when it comes to that conclusion bit in your post, I try to highlight that, make it a wee bit bigger than the rest of the text. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, and then obviously in your poster, you're going to have to have some acknowledgement of your sources of information. Everything nowadays, and I would, well, in my day, did I tell you would retire? Everything in my working years was based on evidence-based practice. There had to be theories around or research or information that, that you would then have to use and build on. So again, it's about being 
up front and honest with you, here's where I got my information and this is the evidence that will back up what I've done. And if you've had additional support from people, okay, maybe a small group of people that you've worked with on the project, but even a wee bit of recognition to, I'm going to smile here, med illustration for helping you produce the poster, or for that wee guy, Les McQueen, that used to do training in Glasgow that reviewed the poster for me and know that I'm looking for any credit or anything for all that fantastic work that I used to do before I retired. Stop rambling. So when you're using images, there is some wee bits of things that you need to be aware of. There's a lot of um, copyright issues. Now, there is a couple of NHS photo libraries that you can draw information on. If you're in any way in doubt, is there a copyright on this photo or this image? Or if you're not sure, do I need to ask the people about taking photographs and things like that? Then in the past, in terms of copyright, I've always gone to um, library services because they're really good and switched on to what is copyright and what is not. And there's a lot of guidance around like how to check that things are copyright free. Sometimes if you just Google kind of three images and things, again, for me, Googling on the internet, they, how, how reliable are they that this is an image that, that you can use? So again, maybe find out a wee bit more around who knows more about me in terms of copywriting and how will they help me? But there is a couple of websites there that we've put, and I've just put them on the bottom of the slide for you. So I'm flying through this really quickly, which is good. When we did the work on the poster presentations, I also did a wee bit of background work. Is there any other sources of information there that will help make this easy for you? So Shona kindly added a couple of extra links for me, but the, the top link that we've put in this for you is really good because there's information there on how to prepare things like academic posters. There's poster templates and things that you can access and have a look at. For me, again, the accessible information policy, we need to be a wee bit aware of kind of maybe some of the equalities issues, people that have visual impairment, things like that. So how do we make the information on our posters easy to access? And I think John, I mentioned earlier on, if you look at good PowerPoint slides, they're all aligned to the left. Normally in posters, we would try and avoid bullet points because people with visual impairment, for example, they're looking for the words the bullets kind of throw them off a wee bit. So again, the accessible information policy would be something worthwhile having a look into. If you, and again, I'll smile here. If I was to ask anybody on the screen now, if somebody asked you for a copy of your poster in Urdu, how would you do that? No easier. I think the thing there would be is you may not be able to provide it in Urdu at that point, but you maybe need to have a chat with some of your service managers and whoever controls your budget to say, if by any chance I've got a request for that, could we financially be able to do it? Or would that be something that we could support? The other wee link at the bottom there, Shona, you put that on. Would you want to just add a wee bit about that? Yeah, so I think actually what Nikki said is is more valuable in terms of our NHS um, GGC resource for AHPs um, through the our quality improvement page, um, which Nikki is brilliantly putting together. So there is access now to some poster stuff on there and she's included some of the skill posters. But the one, the link that's on here just now is all of the skill posters that are available. So that's one of the courses that's run by NACE uh, for quality improvement. So these are good places to look for, for examples. Um, the skill posters are, are there's quite a lot of guidance given in what needs to be in them. Um, and again, I know, Liz, you're going to give a couple of examples um, in terms of the NHS GGC templates, but um, do check out the AHP QI page um, and I'll put a link out for that with the resources as well for today. But thank you for that reminder, Nikki. Okay. I'll pop to a wee link on Thanks, just Lisa. now, just on the chat. Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. Okay, okay. There, you know, when we started this team's presentation skills and poster things, right, I've just discovered an advantage for teams. You kind of get through things a bit quicker because you're not distracted by large audiences or by people throwing in questions. 
because this wee session was kind of going to be roughly half an hour or so, and I'm looking at the clock, and it's only quarter past 11, and I'm thinking, how do I stretch this out a bit to get me to half past? <laughs> but I don't need to. But again, there is advantages probably of things like team calls and Zoom calls that you, you can tend to get through things a wee bit quicker. They're very efficient, Les, and don't worry, we'll fill the time. <laughs> okay, good. So Shona mentioned there that um, there are some templates now the guys in medical illustration, when we used to go to them in the past, were really, really helpful. Part of their job is to actually make sure that you get your posters and the format and things right. So they have templates that you can use. So this is a kind of standard template that you can access through medical illustration. You can either have portrait or landscape, whichever you prefer. In terms of presenting your poster, what we tend, and correct me if I'm wrong, we, we tend to want posters that are large, but um, portrait, because then it makes it easier to then display a series of posters rather than having portrait landscape and that kind of thing. Now, the thing with made illustration in these wee templates is these wee boxes where you're putting your text don't have to be in that order. So you can look at the titles of these and then decide where am I putting the introduction, where do I want, where am I going to put the images? And once you've kind of started to populate it, and remember, populate it with the musts, because your poster just has to highlight the key points of your project. It's not about repeating the whole thing or, or giving information on the whole thing. But once you've got your first draft done, you ping it back to Med Illustration, and they will advise you on things like accessible information, font size, position of your images. And because that's kind of a key part of their job. These guys specialise in how do we make things and like more illustrative. How do we get things looking right? So they're really good. The key thing, though, is when you're working with med illustration, I would check with them up front. If you've got a deadline for when your poster needs to be submitted, check with them in relation to their workload, because it may well take a week or two weeks before they're able to even get your draft back. So it's worthwhile giving them a wee phone and saying, I've got the template, I'm sending you a draft, but if this was to be produced as a final poster, then how long is that going to take? Because then that might mean that you've got to push your kind of time scale back a wee bit to make sure you meet it. And again, there's, there's thoughts here. Um, this is something that I used to think about. You know, we get a lot of posters laminated. Do you need to laminate posters? What do you think? Or can you just have a paper poster without it being laminated? They usually do them on Pico film now, which is a kind of half mix of paper, um, but it, it meets fire regulations, I think is what they do. But the big change now is digital posters because a lot of the conferences right. have been virtual. So I suppose that's the new area we're, we're moving into now. Yeah. I mean, I just think we things like that, there's always cost implications as well. If you've just got like a paper poster, then it costs, if you're laminating things or getting, what was it you said, Pauline? Peak? Pico film, I think it's Pico called. You know I mean, these are wee things that you need to think about because there will be some cost involved in presenting that poster. Med illustration will be looking for some financial input for doing it. So again, it may well be that you need to have a wee think about that, speaking to your service manager and saying, will there be a wee bit of funding or some money available for me to do it? But it's really interesting you're talking about kind of like virtual posters and digital posters and things like that. Again, that's the way we're moving. Whether you can have all digital posters displayed in an auditorium with people and face-to-face -face meetings, I'm not quite sure how that would work like, but so I'm not going to wrap it on. Is that anybody got any questions? Because I've flown through that really quickly. Anybody get any questions they want to ask about posters? It doesn't matter if there's any, not any questions, because that means that the content covered has been enough. Or that it means people are losing the will to live and they've got two cups of coffee. In previous years, it's been an expectation to, to I mean, obviously things have been very different over the last couple of years for, for this cohort, um, but we still wanted to offer the information in terms of putting a poster together. But as Pauline said, even how, how that might be and 
for conferences that you might have for your own professional bodies or for NHS events, it might be that it's in a virtual context, so slightly different again. So there'll be other other information that you'll maybe be saying around your poster. But we just wanted to include the stuff that Les has done in the past, just because that must should could stuff's always so helpful because you've got so much information from your project. So I wonder if there's any kind of thoughts around where people are at in terms of their project and whether they would want to produce a poster in the future, if that's something that anyone's thought about. And we kind of thought that's what it might be because um, it has it's been a crazy, a crazy few months um, and whether you've managed to get reports or anything put together for the projects um, has been a huge expectation. So again, it's not an expectation of the programme to have done that, but we didn't want to leave you without the information. So I hope hope it's been helpful. Um, just a last offer for any comments around posters or anything for Liz. I'll hand over to you, Liz. Can I just finish quickly by saying normally at this point, I would say, should you require any further help or support, I like Tonux tea cakes, wagon wheels, coffee, one spoon of sugar and milk. However, should you need any further help or support, contact anybody on the committee or anybody that's still working because I'm well retired now. Thank you for listening. Can I just stay and join in with the next bit? Of course, of course. Good, good. Thank you for your presentations this morning, Les, and passing your wealth of knowledge, experience and expertise to us. Um, and most importantly, for your continued enthusiasm for us AHPs, your time and especially coming out of retirement. I think you mentioned that you were retired um, to support us today. Um, I'm sure we've all learned something from today's presentations and re have reflected on our own experience and our skills and we will be better presenters for it so thank you very much for your time today thanks les <laughs>